Today in New York, former Democratic presidential candidate Paul Songus, joined by retiring Republican Senator Warren Rudman, announced the formation of the Concord Coalition, a grassroots organization that will be dedicated to solving the problem of the nation's growing budget deficit. Both men have been outspoken this year in their belief that the deficit is one of the nation's most pressing problems, which must be dealt with by both the public and the private sectors. At the time of the news conference, the deficit stood at just over $4.2 trillion. Next on C-SPAN 2, the Songus Rudman News Conference. Good morning. I think the clock behind us tells the story. What it talks about is a generation that is not being responsible to its young. And today we are forming the Concord Coalition to take back the future of this country so that our children and their children can live the kind of life that I think Americans deserve. Yesterday I was at the Concord Bridge in Concord, Massachusetts and thought about all those people who many, many years ago decided this country was worth fighting for and were prepared to give up their lives. What we're here to talk about today is the same kind of dedication to the future. And we believe that the Concord Coalition will be a powerful grassroots organization that will say to the politicians all across this country that the American people are ready for truth, ready to take back the economic future of this country and have a profound sense of sacred obligation to their children. So we picked this site because of that clock behind us to make people understand that it's not money in America. And a lot of the old bromides that have been stated for the last several years by both parties are not appropriate. So today there's a new approach, a new coalition, a new grassroots organization they will say to our children, we recognize the threat that you were under, and today we seek to change that direction. Pete Peterson, I've asked to uh, speak. Pete has been the, I guess, the organizer in a de facto sense of this, and have asked him to talk about the investment and productivity issues inherent in our economic situation today. Pete. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Paul asked me to talk about this from the vantage point of a business uh, person. But first, Paul and Warren, I'd like to say that I consider it a tremendous privilege to w work for you and with you because I consider you two guys among the most brave, the most courageous, the most sensible uh, Americans I know and indeed selfless. I, I could go so far as saying you're real patriots who remind me quite a bit of the Minutemen. Yeah. Now, how does this businessman look at that debt clock sitting back there? First, I want to remind you that if we had been standing here on January 1st, 1980, that clock would have said something like $850 billion. In only 12 years, that number has virtually quintupled. It has added $32,000 of debt to every American household. We are now borrowing 22 cents of every dollar that we're spending. And in effect, what we're doing is we're slipping this huge hidden check for our free lunch to our children and our grandchildren. And you ain't seen nothing yet because the General Accounting Office estimates that if we stay on our current path, in another quarter of a century, we'll be borrowing 45 cents of every dollar that we spend. But America, which is the greatest and the richest of all countries, can and must change its ways because this way is unsustainable politically, morally, fiscally, and certainly economically. Now, this coalition is all about investment. It's all about the future. For example, we propose a substantial program for the underclass because how can we be serious about being world-class competitive when we're leading the world in functional illiterates. We are proposing investments in school to work transition, which our competitors are investing far more in than we are. 
we are proposing investments in R&D, both public and private. We had better start doing that more, because in a world in which ideas and information are the real strategic resource, Japan, for example, by 1995, will be investing relatively twice as much as we. In the old Commerce Department where I used to work, I looked the other day at which companies are getting the U.S. patents in our office. In 1980, none of the top companies were Japanese companies. Last year, all top four in number of U.S. patents were Japanese. We oppose additional investment in crumbling infrastructure, which has become a cliche, if not a redundancy. The Japanese are now investing more than 15 times as much as we. The Germans, over seven times as much. Now, had it not been for the growth of the debt since 1980, let me quantify for you what we could have done. Instead of those interest costs, which buy us absolutely nothing, we could have funded this entire investment program at the public level and some of the much and badly needed private sector investment and not, cut, not have to pay increased taxes, not, not, in, not have to cut benefits, and not increase the deficit at all. We heard a lot about supply side not too many years ago. Supply side was supposed to have meant more investment capital. But all we've done is to turn into a demand side economy in which we're essentially running amok. So when I look at that deck clock, what I see, Paul, is a debt cancer that is metastasizing throughout our entire economy and our society. And if we don't revise and stop that clock from going soon, we're going to uh, reduce our ability to innovate, to compete, and to uh, improve the living standards of ourselves and our children. So this businessman believes that it's time that we restate some very elementarily yet powerful truths about capitalism. Number one, savings is the building block of investment. Number two, investment is the foundation of productivity grains. Number three, increased productivity means uh, increased growth. And number four, economic growth is the engine of prosperity that allows our society to advance. Yet here in America, this is the country that wrote the books on these trucks, on these truths. We've either forgotten them, or worse yet, we have stood them on their head. Now, the biggest reason I'm involved in this and am privileged to work for these two great Americans is very personal. I am a child of immigrants. My parents, both of them, came to America through Ellis Island. And they worked very hard and they saved a lot and they educated their children. As a result, my family and I are the beneficiaries, like many other families are, of the American dream. But in 1992, I see the American dream being deferred for all too many. And frankly, for a few, it's a bit of a nightmare. So I am here today because I want to work with these great Americans to help restore this American dream where the possibility of education and opportunity and upward mobility is there for all and not for a privileged few. I want my children and my grandchildren's generation to be able to both dream and realize that dream. And to get really personal, I have two grandchildren myself, two wonderful kids, Alexandra and Peter Carey. And frankly, I want to be able to look those kids in the eye with a clear conscience. Thank you very much. Hey, you want to go over there? I'm delighted to stand here today with uh, my friend of many years, uh, Paul Songus, and my friend for some years, Pete Peterson, uh, to join in this effort. Uh, let me be blunt. Uh, the two political parties are unable uh, to truly speak the truth because the American people, frankly, uh, don't want to hear it because they don't understand it. Because for too many years, the American people have been led to believe that if we eliminate waste and fraud and cut congressional perks and cut out foreign aid, somehow we can balance the budget. This year, the 175 or 180 billion dollars being spent in interest, much of it to those overseas, will in fact be the third largest item in the federal budget. And in fact, it will continue to grow to the point where by the year 2000, left unabated, unquestionably,
those of you in this audience that are working, particularly those who are young, will find that more, in your, more of your money will go to pay off this debt, to pay this interest, never mind paying off the debt, and your standard of living will be nothing like your parents and your grandparents enjoyed. The reason we're here is because we believe it's time for the citizens of this country to have another voice. What we expect to do is to go across this country, organizing groups of the Concord Coalition, individual citizens, into a vast network of American citizens who have one special interest, the interest of economic growth and a future for the kids of this country. We do not believe that the current system can do that. We believe it's time for the American citizens to do that. We believe that if anything was instructive in the last three months, it was what happened with Mr. Perot's campaign, where many Americans, with great frustration, joined in an idea. They weren't sure of the idea, but they knew they wanted change. What we intend to do is to give them a vehicle for that change. We intend to listen, we intend to speak to them, and have them speak to us. And hopefully sometime uh, the end of this year, early next year, we will be able to put forth some ideas that we think the Congress can act on. Presently serving in the United States Senate, I can tell you that it's not that people don't know what to do, it's that there's great fear in doing what has to be done because there is little understanding out there in the country as to what should be done. In the past presidential campaign, no one stood more tall in my view than Paul Songus. But he didn't win because he spoke the truth. We will speak the truth. I hope to build not thousands, I hope to build a coalition of several million Americans who will bring word to the United States Congress that there are many special interest groups in this country, but there is one overwhelming special interest group. Those are the people who work for a living today, who care about their future, and don't want to see the American dream slip through their hands. To that cause, we dedicate ourselves. Thank you very much. Uh, with due re uh, deference to Jerry Brown, <laughs> this is our 800 number, 1-800-231-6800. Thank you, Jerry. It and Hold it up again, Paul. They want it back there. Put it right here with the Concord Coalition right there. If I could make one final comment, we are not a think tank. We are a grassroots organization, an educational organization that seeks to change the winds politically in this country by educating people to the economic threat and giving them an alternative path. So we're not a think tank, we're not Brookings, we're a kind of economic common cause. And we hope to have people in every city and every town in this country as part of the coalition and be perceived as a 900 pound gorilla that says to the politicians it's safe to do what you know has to be done so go ahead. the uh, question asked us to comment on both the, the Bush and Clinton economic plans let me say that because of our uh, status as an educational institution, it is not appropriate nor legal apparently for us to answer your question. See us later individually, you'll hear us at length. Um, but our task is to form this organization. You know what our positions have been historically, but for the reasons of um, the nonprofit, we are precluded from answering that specifically. But see me tomorrow. And, be glad to do it. Yeah, let me let me just comment that, that what Santa Sanga says, of course, is accurate. I, I, I could say generally that you know there are elements in both plans that I think many of us can agree with, but we do not. I do not believe that there is a comprehensive plan in front of the American people that truly addresses some of the fundamental truths. I mean, what we're really talking about is not pain. Uh, certainly. Uh, in America lately, politically, and certainly in this campaign, it seems that 
people are talking about short-term gain rather than long-term pain. We're not talking about any short-term pain, but we are talking about some sacrifice for long-term gain. And what we are talking about can be done without great dislocation. If we don't do it, there will be tremendous economic dislocation. Some of you may notice in the paper this morning that the government of Italy devalued the lira this morning. I wonder if any Americans who save money would like to contemplate if they could understand what would happen if we have to devalue the dollar four or five years out to meet our obligations. It's a very scary thought, but one well within the realm of possibility. Do you plan to interface with the Ross Perot movement, the former movement, United We Stand? Any of those folks who want to help us would love to have them help. Here, here. What are you going to do with the homeless? Can, can I just answer that? Well, I think there are three organizations that I think will be working in parallel. One is the United We Stand, which is the former Perot organization, uh, the Concord Coalition, and Lead or Leave, the group of young people who have organized in the last two months or so, who I will tell you, as of last night, have 80 people, 10 incumbents, pledged to reduce the deficit in half in four years and not run again. So these three things, I think, demonstrate it's not just us, it's not just the Perot people, but particularly the next generation understands that it is at risk. And so I applaud the work of Leader Leave, and they're doing very well. Yes, ma'am. What are you going to do for the homeless, not of New York City, for the homeless? Because I feel that half of America is dying of starvation and being deprived, and the other half are going to Weight Watchers. Money on it's pretty odd. I live in Lowell, Massachusetts, and grew up in a city that was in economic decline, not just for a couple of years, but for decades. And I can tell you, without economic prosperity, without an expanding economic pie, the problems of the homeless, the disadvantaged, are going to get worse. The best social policy is an economy that expands and that can absorb people, number one. And secondly, I think it's about time in this country we understood that we're all linked. And those who are affluent, those who are wealthy, have to understand that the person out there on the street is an American, just like he or she is, and that if that person on the street does not survive, America does not survive. I just want to say that that I'm profoundly thankful, and I think all of us citizens should be, that you two distinguished guys with different persuasions have uh, developed enough common ground, I sense, to make this coalition a success. Any other questions? Well, we'd like to... You have your own economic package. Uh, as you know, during the campaign, I put my own package out. Um, we have a copy here which we're going to make available to you all, which is very similar. Obviously, we all as individuals have specific commitments that we've made. What we want to do at this point, we have to get an executive director. We want to reach out to um, have a group of co-chairs and vice chairmen who reflect the composition of this country. We're all white males. That's not how you get this thing done. And before we proceed, with a, an agenda that is more specific, we want to have a group that includes every group in the United States and represents men and women equally. So I will tell you that the executive director as Kitty Kurth, the organizational director, will both be women to offset some of the uh, obvious singleness of the three of us up here. I want to add one thing here if I could. As far as an economic plan, uh, the I want to just emphasize what, what Paul Songer said, uh, we are not a think tank because enough thinking has already been done. The problem is not that the solutions are not known. The solutions are known. The problem is there has not been the political will to implement those solutions. Uh, to that end, uh, in Washington for the last year, a very interesting group headed by, curiously, a Democrat and a Republican, Senator Nunn of Georgia and Senator Domenici of New Mexico, called the Strengthening of America found it, group, has put together with Georgetown University and a group of distinguished Americans a very interesting plan. I believe that we will be looking at that plan and others in order to come forth with the solutions which are known. The question is not 
is there a solution? There is. The question is, which of the solutions will we take? And so we are not going to devote an enormous amount of time to research and thinking. That's already been done. What we want to do is to bring forth the American people what the real issues are, to make them understand that there is no such thing as a free lunch, and we all have to pitch in together if we're going to make America strong again. So there are many things that we can look at for economic plans. And we will, in the coming weeks, be announcing a distinguished group of Americans, as Paul said, representing all walks of life, and then we will go forward across this country. This is the beginning, and unless there are other questions, uh, I guess there are. How do you re I realize this is an economic coalition, but how do you reconcile... Are you here? I realize this is an economic coalition, but how do you reconcile strong economic growth with a sound environmental policy? You can answer that. Hey, I like our motorcade behind us. We're very well organized. Um, as you know, the environment has been my major interest uh, all these many years. I happen to believe that good environmental policy is good economics. You look at Eastern Europe where they had no environmental policy and look what's happening. To the extent you despoil your environment, you're not going to be attractive to the kind of industries we want to have around. So those who say that there's a trade-off between jobs and the environment are talking politically, they're not talking economics. And I will tell you, I serve on eight corporate boards, never once in eight years has anyone ever suggested inside those boards that trash in the environment is good economics? You only hear that from the politicians. Is it going to be a factor in your position papers here? We will deal with the environment as we get more specific. Paul, why don't we walk back to some of the press there who want to ask some questions just for a couple of... We'll, we'll walk back there for a couple of minutes to answer a couple of questions and then I think we'll be on our way. Uh, to, to repeat the... Uh, I'm a product of my last experience, 800 number. Go ahead. Is a 1-800-231-6800. Did I get that right? Thanks, Jerry. So we invite everybody to <laughs> to uh, join us and look forward to this thing becoming a major force in American politics. Thank you. Pete, hey, hey, Pete. Paul, let's make it work. <laughs>